Welcome. This presentation is about heteroscedasticity. So where do we stand in the course? Um, we've uh, just started with part two of the course. Heteroscedasticity is the first topic. Um, that is chapter eight in the book by Wooldridge. And um, after that, we're going to cover still chapter 10, 12, and 15 and 16. What is heteroscedasticity? One way um, to illustrate that is to draw uh, this figure here, which is taken from Wooldridge's book, figure 2.9. What we do see here is three axes. One, two, three. On this axis here, we have years of education, how long somebody went to school. On this axis here, we have the wage that person earns on the labor market. And on this axis here, we have the density of wages given education. So what we can draw into this three-dimensional figure is um, the relationship between expected wages and education. And um, in this course, we discuss the linear model. So this is a linear relationship. Um, and here I mean linear in the parameter. So there's an intercept, beta zero, that would be this value here. And there's a slope, um, beta one. So if education increases, then basically the distance between this axis here and this uh, line here giving expected wages given education increases. Now what you see here is three points of evaluation, 16 years of education, 12 years of education, and eight years of education. Um, and then the dashed line always crosses this um, regression line. That is the predicted value or the expected value of wages given that many years of education. And then what you see around that is the distribution of wages given education. Now what you see is um, that um, the distribution um, for lower years of education, eight years and 12 years, has a lower variance. What is that variance? Well, ultimately this is the variance of the error term in my regression equation. Homoscedasticity uh, would mean that that variance of the error term does not depend on the number of years of education. What we see here, however, um, is that it does depend. Um, it differs. Um, and in particular, the variance of wages given education is higher for higher years of education. What could be the underlying reason? Well, if you have more educated people, um, then um, they have access to a broader set of jobs um, so that means that uh, when you look at the distribution of uh, wages um, for more educated people, it will have a higher variance. This is exactly what gives rise to something that is called heteroscedasticity. So what we do here is we study problems caused by heteroscedasticity, basically problems when we estimate uh, things and their solution. Um, these problems in a way start with the word heteroscedasticity itself. Um, and uh, there's even an article in uh, the prestigious journal Econometrica um, about um, this debate. Uh, and in particular, the debate was about whether heteroscedasticity should be spelled with a K or with a C. And since it comes from uh, Greek, um, it should actually be a K. And this is what this article, it's a one page article, it's actually a note, um, argues. Um, you see here, this is uh, blue, uh, so you can uh, click on it in the PDF version of the slides and you will um, get to that article. This uh, presentation is divided up into four parts. I'm going to start by talking about the consequences of heteroscedasticity for OLS estimation. The second part is about heteroscedasticity robust inference after OLS estimation. The third part is about testing for heteroscedasticity. And the fourth part covers 
weighted least squares estimation. So let's start with the first part. Here we see the assumptions of the multivariate linear regression model that we have seen before, one through six. Uh, you might remember that um, one, two, three, and four are the essential ones for unbiasedness of the estimator, and that five and six have something to do with the um, precision, precision of the estimates or asymptotic properties of the estimator. Let's quickly uh, walk through these assumptions. Um, the first one is a functional form assumption uh, that the model is linear in parameters, and the parameters here are the betas. Um, the second assumption is random sampling, essentially that um, uh, we have observations that come all from this model and that um, we have cross-sectional data. So uh, we have observations for uh, units I, individuals, firms, whatever, um, and they're all sampled from this model. Uh, number three is no perfect collinearity, so no variable is a um, function of another one, a linear function of another one, or an exact linear uh, combination of other ones, and no uh, variable is um, constant uh, across observations. So there is variation in these variables. Number four um, is mean independence of the error term uh, of the um, axis, and that is really the essential assumption um, uh, that we need uh, to say something about causality. We're going to talk about that later some more. Um, it does mean that there's a zero correlation between u and the axis or a zero covariance, um, and we really need that for interpretation. Five and six, um, uh, and, and, and you see this here already, um, so this is now about second moments. A variance is the second moment of a distribution, um, so it's the variance of u that will not depend on x. So you see that the variance of u is uh, sigma square for all uh, units, observations i, um, and then six is really a distributional assumption for the error term that is not necessary um, but it helps us uh, to, to get a bit further when it comes to uh, developing uh, tests and other results. Um, so that was normality of the error term. Please uh, let me stress here, and I'm going to stress this again and again, um, we don't need normality. Uh, so I often uh, see in uh, you know, uh, exam answers that people say um, we need normality. We don't need it. Um, we need it for certain things, but normally we don't need it. Good. Now, where does heteroscedasticity come into play? Heteroscedasticity, homoscedasticity. So yeah, um, basically heteroscedasticity means assumption number five does not hold anymore. And if assumption number five um, does not hold, then assumption number six does not hold either because um, here this normal distribution has that same sigma square as the variance. Good. So here I'm writing this down um, uh, for you. So heteroscedasticity will be a violation of the fifth assumption. It does not cause bias or inconsistency of the OLS estimator because um, bias or inconsistency only arises uh, when one of the uh, first four assumptions is violated. If the fifth one is violated, OLS estimators are still unbiased and consistent. This is what we have shown before. So you can go back and you will see that we don't need to assume uh, MLR5 um, uh, for unbiasedness or consistency. What is important, however, is um, that we want to estimate the variances at some point. And for this, we do actually um, need um, homoscedasticity as an assumption if we want to proceed in the way we have discussed so far. Okay, so when we use the formulas that you have seen up to now, then it will mean that these will be wrong. These will not work. Um, the OLS standard errors using those formulas um, will not be um, consistently estimated. Uh, and that means T stats, F stats, and confidence intervals will be invalid. Okay, the second thing is that um, uh, we have talked about blue as a property, uh, that OLS is the best linear unbiased estimator. And um, 
for this uh, to be actually true, uh, we need the homoscedasticity assumption. Um, if homoscedasticity does not hold, then obviously um, the blue property will um, not hold anymore. Uh, so uh, this is definitely um, the second um, implication of a violation of homoscedasticity. Now, um, later we will talk about weighted least squares um, as an efficient fix. So basically we can construct an efficient estimator in the presence of heteroscedasticity, but what we need for that is some prior knowledge um, of the form of heteroscedasticity um, with sufficiently large samples. Um, however, efficiency is really not our prime concern. Okay, so the prime concern in an empirical analysis is oftentimes um, consistency or unbiasedness of the estimator. That basically um, we're shooting at the right target, um, that we get estimates that have the right interpretation. And for this, we really need this um, mean independence assumption for the error term. That was assumption number four. Um, this is really... Um, uh, the centerpiece uh, of, of an empirical analysis to worry about that, not about efficiency. Um, but we will uh, nevertheless um, discuss weighted least squares at the end of this lecture, um, also because um, it's actually a special case of generalized least squares, and generalized least squares will come back later when we talk about time series data. What we will do first is um, to discuss actually a modern approach to heteroscedasticity, which is to run OLS um, in the exact same way as we have said before, and then uh, to, um, to get um, robust standard errors. And robust standard errors basically are standard errors that don't need uh, the assumption of homoscedasticity. So, with heteroscedasticity, you can get any way consistent or unbiased estimates. What we now want to have is to also get the right standard errors. And this is what we're going to focus on. And this is also what uh, in modern applied work normally is done. And many modern econometrics packages compute such adaptive statistics, um, you know, uh, uh, regularly. So there's no uh, coding required on your part. This brings us to heteroscedasticity robust inference after OLS estimation. Um, as I said before, um, all we need um, for estimation is assumption 1, 2, 3, and 4. So let us start by assuming that these assumptions hold. We do not need assumption number five, uh, which would be homoscedasticity. Here what you have is um, the linear relationship that we always start with in this model. And what we do is we do write the variance of the error term given x as sigma square i. Okay, so homoscedasticity would simply have sigma square instead of sigma square i. Now let's first look into um, the OLS standard errors, um, as you have seen them before. And, um, you know, um, let's recall how we would actually derive that. And there will be a little bit of repetition now for you, but I think um, that's actually instructive to go through the argument once more. Um, if you uh, fully recall what um, we have done before, um, you can just as well fast forward uh, this video here. So let's start with the OLS estimator of beta one. And um, let's just think of the uh, simple regression model, right? Um, just an intercept and a slope. Um, and what you might vaguely remember is that you can write it like this. So beta hat one would be uh, beta one, that is the true value that we're actually trying to estimate, plus um, this fraction here. What do we have here? We have 
basically the covariance between the error terms and um, the axis divided by the variance of the axis. And you know, as I said, some of you might perfectly recall um, how this thing uh, is um, derived. Um, but for those um, who don't perfectly recall this, I'm just going to rederive that quickly, um, simply so that we all uh, have the feeling that we understand what's going on here. And I'm actually going to do this here with uh, paper and pencil. So let's see how that goes. Um, so what I will do is I will start with um, beta hat one, um, as you have basically seen it uh, before in the lecture. And one way to write beta hat one is um, like this. So I'm going to have uh, the covariance between x and y. x i minus x bar, y i minus y bar, divided by the variance of x. And uh, to be um, precise, um, this quantity here is uh, the, um, well, if I would add one over n here, and I would add one over n here, uh, then this would be an estimator of the variance of the covariance between x and y. And this would be an estimator of the covariance um, of the variance of x. We don't need that. This cancels away. Good. So the next thing I can do is um, to actually um, look at this yi here um, and um, substitute in the model that we have. So then I would get bigger expression xi minus xi minus x bar. And then for yi, I'm going to get beta naught plus beta one xi plus ui and then you know minus y bar so i just take to have to take the average of that business so the average of beta naught is beta naught minus beta one x bar minus and then the average of ui will be u bar one remark u bar is not zero on average what is zero on average is the fitted value uh, or the residual, but not the actual error term ui. But you have heard that before, I'm pretty sure. Good. Um, and in the denominator, we simply have the same expression. So, Next thing to do is to realize, well, here's a beta naught, here's a beta naught, goes away. Okay. Um, and then, you know, what I have here is a fraction. I can always write this as two fractions. So what I will have to do is, I just have to divide this up. The denominator obviously is exactly the same for both um, parts. All right. And then um, what is also exactly the same is this, um, this part here. I'm going to have i is equal to 1 and xi minus x bar. And here the same thing. So that's the exact same thing. Um, and then what I will have here is all the business 
uh, that has something to do with beta 1 and xi. So it will be beta 1 and then I have xi and I have minus x bar because here I have beta 1 x bar. So I will have, sorry, this should be an i, minus x bar. And then here what I will have is everything that has something to do with um, ui. So I'm going to have ui minus u bar. Good. Now, um, what I can do is I can uh, rewrite stuff a little bit. So let's see. Let's first look at uh, this first um, uh, this first guy here. Um, what I do have is that there's beta one, and beta one is basically a multiplicative constant inside a sum. Right? I have the sum of this part times beta one times this part. Okay. And since this is a constant, I can just pull it to the front. So I get beta one times, and then what is left is x i minus x bar uh, times x i minus x bar, and then the sum of all this um, over i from one to n divided by this quantity here. And obviously, um, this is just in the end of the day, uh, the same in the numerator as I have in the denominator. But let me just write that out for you. So that's 1 to n, there will be xi minus x bar, xi minus x bar, and then here I have um, xi minus x bar squared. Hmm? And this is of course the same as this. So this whole thing goes away. And then for the second part, what I have is here, basically the covariance. Well, uh, if I would divide by n, I would have the covariance between u and x. And here I would have the variance of x if I would divide by n. Okay. Um, so the last thing I want to do is um, to um, basically note that here xi, um, is on average x bar. So uh, this term here is actually uh, on average um, zero. And when I have that and I take the sum over something that is on average zero, and uh, I have like a second component here, um, then basically I can get rid of the, um, of, of one of the two, of, of the uh, average here uh, of uh, the UI. So that's that's basically, a result uh, that you might have seen before. So I can, and I will not do that here, but I can basically just get rid of the u-bar and it will be um, still hold. So all you have to do to show this is to write this out and you will basically see that the u-bar um, is then you get here x-bar times u-bar minus x-bar times u-bar. So it will cancel out. So what this means is to cut a long story short, that I can write this um, in the following way. i is equal to 1 to n xi minus x bar squared. Um, and here I have i is equal to 1 to n xi minus x bar times ui. And magic, this is exactly um, what we did have on this slide here, right? So this is exactly this um, expression here. Now, um, let's take this as a starting point and um, derive the expression for the variance of our estimator of beta one. And um, as um, we've told you before, um, what we do here uh, when we derive that is to actually think implicitly um, about these x's as being fixed or technically speaking, we do condition on all the x's we have in our data. So what we're going to derive is 
the variance of beta one hat. Let me get back to my sheet of paper here. This here is my uh, beta one hat. Um, and I'm going to derive the variance of beta one hat. In order to do that, it's actually useful uh, to remind ourselves of a couple of, um, you know, uh, rules uh, for dealing with variances. So the first one um, is going to be, and I'm just going to put them here for the moment. The first one is going to be that the variance of a constant A plus another constant uh, B times UI is given by B square times the variance of UI. Okay, um, so basically A um, will be uh, my true value beta 1, which is this thing here, right? This here cancelled away and the B will be all the business uh, with the axis uh, that I will be dealing with, okay? And the UIs are these UIs really, okay? Um, the second um, thing to know that is uh, relevant here is that when I have the variance of a sum, U1 plus U2 plus U3, okay, say, and um, these are independent observations, right? Uh, so my draw um, of the error term for the first individual is independent from my draw for the second and is independent uh, from my draw for the third individual. Then what I get is that this is equal to variance of u1 plus variance of u2 plus variance of u3, okay? And I'm going to denote them by sigma square 1, sigma square 2, and sigma square 3. Okay, so you get the idea. Okay, with um, this in hand, what I want to do is I want to derive the variance of beta 1 hat. I have an expression for beta 1 hat here. Right, so what I have to do is to basically plug that in. So I want to have the variance of beta one plus, and then as I told you before, um, you know, this business with the xi minus x bar times ui. And here I have um, i is equal to 1 to n x i minus x bar squared. Okay. So now it's useful uh, actually to rewrite that a little bit. So what I'll do is um, I'll basically um, I'm, I'm going to focus on, so the central sum in all this is this sum here, okay? And, and, and what I have written down here um, basically will apply to this sum here. This thing here is basically um, just something that involves on the axis. Um, so these axes um, we're going to think of, um, as I also told you, as basically fixed, right? Because we, we condition implicitly on these axes. Okay, so these are constant. These are not uh, random variables um, uh, in, in the argument here. So, and the other thing we will uh, note is that obviously this beta one uh, is like this A here. This is just a constant, okay? The beta one is really just a true value um, of that um, coefficient. And that will be the A here. And as you can see here, huh, the variance of A plus BU is basically 
not involving A anymore. So this, this one here goes away. So this will be the variance of, and I'm now going to write this as 1 over i goes from 1 to n, and this is now just the denominator, xi minus x bar square times, and then I have this stuff here, so this stuff here I'm just going to write like this. xi minus x bar times ui. And I'm going to close um, the set of parentheses. Good. Next. Um, so this business here, I can treat as a constant, right? So there's nothing random. I think of these x's as um, a constant, so I can pull it out. But in order to pull it out, what I have to do, huh? so it's, it's basically like this b, um, I have to square it. So what I will get is 1 divided by the sum, these sums always go from 1 to n for i, uh, xi minus x bar squared, and I put square brackets, and I squared because this b is squared, times, now I have the variance of the sum goes from 1 to n xi minus x bar ui. Good. Next, I'm going to make use of this business here. I know that these ui's are independent of one another, right? Uh, so the uh, error term for the first individual is independent from the error term for the second and so on and so forth. So I have a variance of a sum and therefore I can write this as the sum of the variances. So this stuff here stays exactly the same. But now what I will get is uh, I'm basically pulling the sum out. And I can only do that. I cannot always do that. I can only do that because these UIs are the only random variables and these are independent of one another. So I get here the sum of the variance of, and then you know what stays is xi minus x bar uh, ui, right? But then I can actually do one thing right away as well. Since I know that um, this is the variance of xi minus x bar ui, xi minus x bar is again just a constant, right? So I can just as well square that and put it in front of the variance. So what I get is xi minus x bar squared variance of ui. Okay, so this looks already uh, pretty good. Um, what you basically now have is the result. Okay, uh, so um, when we go back to this slide here, then you see that, right? Uh, so um, what we have is the term in square brackets is exactly the same as I had um, on my sheet of paper. And um, here I have in the numerator, I have exactly the expression I did have. Okay, so then the last thing uh, to actually um, show is that this equals the expression you have seen before under homoscedasticity.
So this is the point, and, and therefore I find it actually quite interesting to go through this once more. This is the point where you do need homoscedasticity to get to the formula that you have seen before. So what we have to do is um, to basically say if, okay, if variance of ui is equal to sigma square. So this one here is sigma square i. Okay, so basically if sigma square i is equal to sigma square, so if the variance of the error term is the same for everybody, then, um, then we need to basically show that the formula that you already know um, comes out of all this. Okay, so let me do that. So then we have that the variance of beta one hat is equal to. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with this expression here and I'm going to try to get to the expression you already know. And that's actually quite easy. So um, here is a sum um, uh, over i. And we could not simplify all this business further because we could basically not um, pull the sigma i square out uh, of this sum. But if the sigma i square uh, or the variance of ui is actually now the same, it doesn't depend on i anymore, then it is just a constant that I can just put in the very front of this whole expression. So let me do that. Then basically this sigma square i or this variance of ui did, does become um, uh, sigma square. I can put it to the front, I have it like this. And what remains is the following. So in square brackets, uh, let me just write that in a different way. So here, this is just this expression squared. I can just as well write this twice. Hmm. Uh, times and then once more. Squared like this. Okay. And then of course I shouldn't forget about that part. So I'm just going to put that here. Here we go. Let me put some uh, parentheses around that. And what you do see is that basically this expression here cancels with one of these two. Okay. So this goes away. And what you end up with is exactly the expression you've seen. Sigma square divided by the sum from 1 to n of xi minus x bar squared. So we can look at this on the slide once more. This is exactly the expression we just got. Good. So um, based on all this, what can we do? Well, it's actually um, relatively straightforward. Um, uh, so what we can do is we can take the formula that we um, have just derived and take the um, empirical counterpart of it. So when you look at this, then you have here uh, that an estimate, an estimator of the variance of beta one hat, so variance hat of beta one hat is given by this expression with the one difference that we have replaced the sigma square i's by um, residuals for i squared. This is intuitive, but it's not obvious that it will work, right? Um, we will not show here why it will work, um, but it is quite intuitive that it actually will work, okay? Um, because basically what you're doing is you're estimating um, uh, the variance um, for individual i by just, you know, uh, imperfectly um, 
uh, or you're proxying that variance um, by uh, the squared residual. And then, you know, since you're averaging over individuals, this will give you in the end of the day the right thing. Okay, um, so it is a valid estimator of um, the variance of um, your estimator for beta one. Um, and, um, you know, in order to show that, one has to show the following thing. One has to show that n times um, that object here, or basically that object here, converges in probability um, to um, uh, this expression here. And that is the probability limit of n times the actual um, variance of beta 1 hat. And that was the formula that we have seen on the previous slide. Okay. Um, one thing that's interesting, and, and we're not going to do that here. Um, one thing that's interesting to see here uh, in this formula uh, on the slide is that, you know, um, you have here a sum squared, and in the numerator you have a sum, okay? Uh, so what you see uh, when n um, becomes bigger, then the denominator will grow faster, okay? And uh, this is, of course, um, you know, uh, how it has to be because um, when we have more and more observations, then uh, the variance uh, of my estimator of beta 1, the variance of beta 1 hat should decrease. And when I just go back one slide, uh, then we had, of course, a similar thing going on with this quantity here uh, under homoscedasticity. So what you see here is um, you have here the variance of the residual, okay, uh, or the variance of the error term, sigma square, uh, and that is divided by a sum, right? And the bigger n, uh, the more uh, components that sum has. So, um, you know, when, when n increases, then I'm dividing basically by more squared terms. And uh, for that reason, you know, also here one can see directly that the variance is going down. Good. Um, so the square root of um, that estimator of the variance um, of um, my estimator of uh, beta 1 uh, gives the heteroscedasticity robust standard errors, and they're also known as white or Uber or ICA standard errors. Okay, and um, for all this to work, we need some technical assumptions, um, uh, but they're not of interest uh, for this uh, course here. So we'll skip them for now. Good. Um, so, you know, this is um, the gist of the argument, and I've shown this to you um, for the bivariate simple model, um, but it all extends to multiple regression um, under these uh, first four assumptions. And then um, one can get to a heteroscedasticity robust T statistics um, in the way, in a way very similar to the one uh, in uh, chapter four um, by replacing the uh, OLS standard errors by robust ones. And um, one also can uh, derive heteroscedasticity robust F statistics. Um, this is harder. Um, but they're also routinely computed by econometric packages. So if you just want to use them, you don't have to bother about the derivation. They're just there. You can just use them. Um, so in large samples, this works perfectly fine. Um, and uh, one could even make the point um, that one just uh, should routinely use uh, heteroscedasticity robust standard errors. Um, in smaller samples, it's a little bit different. We're going to look into some details. Um, in a bit. Uh, this is like a super famous um, uh, development uh, in econometrics and the original 80s, uh, 1980 paper of White um, uh, in econometric has been cited over 21,000 uh, times. Um, for example, also in a famous study of economic growth, right? Um, where basically a regression was run uh, using a cross section of countries. And um, there, um, it's conceivable that the standard, um, that the uh, error term has a bigger variance for bigger countries, basically. And, uh, 
and and we'll get back to that uh, later as well. Good. Uh, so this brings us um, to uh, the next topic, which is testing for heteroskedasticity. I know that some of you um, like shorter video clips, um, so. Um, I'm going to keep that um, as one clip, um, but if you would like to take a break, now is a very natural point to uh, take a break, um, and then you can just come back uh, to this uh, point in the video, um, and otherwise uh, I'll just um, continue. So, testing for heteroskedasticity. Why would we want to do that? Um, so, of course, um, one thing you can always do is um, you can uh, get your estimates, um, you get your standard errors um, using uh, the assumption, built on the assumption of homoskedasticity, uh, so just the usual OLS standard errors, and then you also get um, heteroskedasticity robust standard errors, and if the two um, are not too different from one another, in some sense it doesn't matter anyway. Um, but you might want to, uh, you know, uh, Ask the question, you know, can I can I go further than that? Um, uh, and uh, the answer is yes. Uh, and uh, now I'll briefly uh, show you how you can do that. Um, another motivation um, for this um, is that um, the uh, TNF statistics um, in uh, chapter four um, they have exact TNF distributions under um, the six assumptions uh, that we have. Uh, written down, um, so uh, assumption one through six, um, you know, um, while heteroskedasticity robust st statistics are only justified for large samples. And a big question is always, you know, what is a large sample? Um, so sometimes you just know, right? So when you have thousands and thousands and thousands of observations, big data, whatever, whatnot, um, then it's easy to make that point um, that you have large samples and that you shouldn't worry. But sometimes, you know, you run a regression with just a few um, observations and then actually, um, you know, um, it might be good to just show uh, that um, heteroskedasticity is not a big issue. Okay, but yeah, so it really depends on the context. Nevertheless, I think it's worth um, uh, quickly going through um, uh, you know, one of the classic tests. And this is actually the uh, Broish Pagan uh, test uh, for heteroskedasticity. And it's also quite uh, intuitive, actually. And it is good to go through it uh, to build some more intuition, if you like. Good. Um, so let's start with assumption one through four. Okay. And let's say. Um, we have a model with k explanatory variables, x1 through xk. And then we know, you know, from these four assumptions, we've shown that, that um, our OLS estimators for the intercept and the k uh, slope coefficients are unbiased and consistent. Okay? That's great. Um, so let's look into testing. So first of all, when I have unbiased and consistent estimates, um, that does mean um, that um, I'm somehow able to get at, you know, the use um, by looking uh, at uh, residuals. And this is exactly uh, what we'll do now when we do this test. But let's go step by step. So we start with a null hypothesis. Okay, our null hypothesis is homoskedasticity. Okay, so our null hypothesis is assumption number five. And here's again assumption number five, the variance of the uh, error term given the axis is equal to sigma square. Okay, doesn't depend on i, doesn't depend on any of the axes. What is the alternative hypothesis? It is heteroskedasticity or a violation of assumption number five. Okay, so uh, that would mean that um, the variance of u depends on one or more of the axes. And one particular way in which this could be the case is that 
um, the variance of u is given by a function h that depends on these axes times sigma square and that h function is the exponential function with like a linear index, right? A linear combination of these axes um, and that linear combination has coefficients delta, delta zero up to delta k. Um, and if um, only, um, you know, the first x has an impact, um, then it would mean that delta two, three up to delta k would be zero, okay? Um, but, you know, uh, this is just one particular functional form uh, that could generate heteroscedasticity or um, a violation of uh, homoscedasticity. Good. So, what is the uh, Breusch Pagan test uh, now doing? Um, what we do know is um, that um, under the null hypothesis, the variance of u given x is equal to the expectation of u square given x, okay? And therefore I can write the null hypothesis as the expectation of u square given x is equal to sigma square, okay? Now in order uh, to um, detect, um, to detect heteroscedasticity, I have to start with some formulation of an alternative, okay? And that alternative could look like this. Uh, so let's say we look at a linear relation and that linear relation would mean that u square is a linear combination of the axis plus an error term and the error term would have um, uh, an expectation of um, zero conditional on uh, the axis. So it would not depend on the axis. Then what we could do is um, we could test this null hypothesis by testing whether um, delta one, delta two, and so on, up to delta k are actually equal to zero. Okay, by testing this null hypothesis. So it could be, no, put differently, um, if we can reject this null hypothesis, then we can reject um, the uh, null hypothesis of homoscedasticity. However, it could be that a linear relation is not so appropriate. Um, then it could in principle be that if we can't reject um, uh, that null hypothesis down here, it could still be that this null hypothesis does not hold, okay? Because, you know, um, it could be that the linearity basically uh, uh, makes it hard to reject that null. But let's forget about this uh, for the moment. Let's just say we're trying uh, to reject this null hypothesis here. And this null hypothesis is for this linear relationship here. Um, notice that this linear relationship actually um, is um, having the u squares on the left hand side. Okay, the u squares are the actual error terms. The problem is we don't know the actual error terms. All we know is um, the residuals, right? So these can be seen as estimates of these error terms, um, but these are not the actual error terms. However, um, it turns out um, that for testing this null down here, we can replace the true error term squared by the residuals squared. Now, how do we do this in practice? Um, what we do is we estimate the original model with OLS. We obtain the OLS uh, residuals. Um, they're here denoted by ui hat, as before. Um, and then what we do is we square them and we run OLS on 
uh, this equation here. So we estimate these deltas. Okay, we regress the squared residuals on the axis, and then we do an F test um, for uh, the joint hypothesis that all the slope coefficients are zero, and this has approximately an F distribution, this test statistic, um, uh, with k and n minus k minus one degrees of freedom under the null hypothesis, and you know, as it should be, um, a high value of the F statistic or a small p value um, will be evidenced against homoscedasticity. Okay, so then we will be able uh, to reject the null hypothesis um, if the value of the F statistic is bigger than the critical value uh, or if the p value is lower than um, the chosen significance level. And if the null hypothesis of homoscedasticity is rejected, then for sure uh, we know that we should not trust um, the standard or as uh, standard errors. Um, so assumption number five uh, does not hold. Uh, so at the minimum, we need heteroscedasticity robust standard errors and test statistics. And, you know, what we might want to do is um, to use weighted least squares estimation. And this is actually um, the next topic I would like to talk about. All right, um, so first of all, why would you want to do that? Um, so um, as I said before, um, the sort of consensus um, among applied researchers um, uh, these days is that you don't really need that if you have a lot of data. Um, so that might be different. Um, you know, sometimes, sometimes you do not have so much data. Um, and then um, it could be an idea to actually do that. Um, why would you want to do that? Well, um, weighted least squares is efficient uh, to start with. Um, so um, if you get it right, um, what you uh, get as a return is you get more precise estimates. Okay. Um, and why am I covering this here? Well, it's a special case of generalized least squares, which is something that is actually used um, in particular uh, in time series contexts. Uh, so um, in terms of learning about it, um, it's actually a good point um, uh, to, to uh, have a first look at it. Okay. So let's, let's have a look. Um, so let's assume that assumption one through four actually hold, but number five does not hold. And let's assume as before, that there's a linear relationship between Y and X, okay? And let's assume, uh, and that is now um, very important, um, that I have a particular uh, relationship, or I have a particular specification for the variance of these U's um, and how, how it depends on the axis. Uh, it is given by sigma square times a function h of the axis. So there's a part as the sigma square from before, and then there's this h part that only depends on the axis. And let's assume for now uh, that this function h is actually known. Okay. So for instance, um, very simple example, uh, that function h of all the x's could be simply uh, given by x1, okay? Um, and um, uh, what, what, can you, what can you think about here? Well, think about countries um, and think about simply aggregating variables, okay? Um, and then you know, like uh, for some countries, um, they aggregated um, for more individuals, and for other countries for less. And then you can imagine that X1 is simply population. So when you aggregate um, for more individuals, um, you get something more noisy. Um, and aggregating is really, um, you know, adding up. So um, let's write, and this is something we have seen before, sigma square i, the variance of ui given the axis 
and that is sigma squared times this function h. So let's write this as sigma square h i. Okay. Let's start with um, the regression equation we did have. This one here. Okay. Uh, and you know, uh, let's note the following. Let me actually um, uh, kind of uh, look at this uh, using a pen and paper again. Um, so um, we did have that the variance of ui given um, x i1 up to um, x i k was given by sigma square uh, times h i. Okay, this is simply, um, and I can show this to you here, uh, here, right? Uh, so the variance of u i given these x's is given by sigma square uh, times h i. Okay, um, so if I now look at this for a moment, then of course I see, okay, um, I knew that uh, a plus b u i has a variance of b square variance u i, right? So um, this h i now is basically my b square. So if I want to go back, what I have to do is I have to take the square root. So what I have to do now is I have to take the square root of h i and put it back in. So when I look at the variance of the square root of h i, no, I'm sorry. If I look at the variance of, so if I want to undo this h i, right, I have to basically um, undo it inside here with a square root. So uh, I can take u i, I can divide by the square root of h i, okay? And then what I get is that this is, you know, I, I now pull it out, then I get one over h i times the variance of u i, and that will be, 1 over h i times variance of u i is sigma squared times h i. So it will actually cancel out. Okay, uh, and obviously I have to make that argument conditional on the x's x i 1 up to x i k x i 1 up to x i k okay um, so again I know that the variance of u i given x is sigma square h i so when I then look at the variance of u i divided by the square root of h i, I can see that I can pull that out. So it gets one uh, over h i times the variance of u i given x i. So I get one over h i times sigma square times h i. So why is that now useful? Um, well, when I start with this equation here, which is simply my regression equation, and I divide it by the square root of h i. Okay, this is a linear equation, so you know I divide the left hand side and the right hand side um, uh, by the square root of h i. So that means I just divide every single component. 
um, by hi. So I'm getting uh, what I have here uh, in the last line. <clears throat> Let me now simply denote um, things that are divided by hi with a star. Then what I get is hmm, this linear uh, regression equation simply with stars. Now comes the um, fun part. So if, if um, uh, assumptions one, two, three, and four were satisfied, um, then they're still satisfied. You can just check that because uh, all I've done is I've basically rescaled the variables. Okay, uh, so that's that's really not something um, that makes a big difference. So when I had no collinearity before I rescaled the var variables, I have no collinearity afterwards. Um, uh, so that's that's great. Um, and if the error term was normally distributed, so that's assumption six uh, before, and I rescale it, um, it will still be uh, normally distributed. What is the fun part now is um, that um, ui star is uh, my new error term. And the fun part is that by the argument I've shown you before, um, ui star actually has now a variance of sigma square. So I do have actually a homoscedasticity um, uh, for ui star. What I need for that, however, is that my h function is um, correctly specified. For now, you know, I'm just making uh, the argument and I said, you know, let's say um, it's of a particular form and the function h is known. Okay, so if the function h is, no is known, it's, it's actually simple. Uh, then I just do this transformation and I um, uh, run OLS uh, with the transformed variables um, and the OLS estimator will be the best linear unbiased estimator. Um, another way to think about this is actually uh, that one reweights observations and that corresponds um, to what I said to you before that when there's heteroscedasticity you might want to give more weight to observations um, that have a smaller variance and you want to give less weight to observations that have a bigger variance. Okay, um, so um, let me now just go back one slide. So the variance of u given x is sigma square times hi. Okay, so um, what you see here is a bigger hi means a higher va variance. Um, and at the same time, uh, when I'm uh, minimizing the sum of squared residuals, what I will do is I will minimize um, this quantity here. And, um, you know, I do this, uh, I sum them up from one to n for i, um, and basically when the hi is big, then I divide these, uh, this squared residual uh, by a lot, whereas when the hi is small, I will divide it by less. And in that sense, I'm weighting observations, okay? Um, now, you can say this is all nice, uh, but of course, you know, I, I, I don't know this function h. So what should I do? Um, uh, so first of all, sometimes you do actually have a good idea about this function h. And this is this uh, example I talked about before. So, um, uh, you know, one can think of heteroscedasticity as being known um, in the context of a macro model. Um, where per capita uh, data is aggregated from an individual level um, model that satisfies uh, assumption one through five. Um, and um, if you want to see an example, um, you can look at uh, Barrow's uh, famous uh, study with the uh, cross-country regressions. Um, usually, um, 
However, um, you're less lucky. Um, and then uh, what you can do is you can basically just um, guess um, uh, a good function of form or try a few ones uh, and, and, and see which one works best. Um, one that is kind of natural um, is um, this one here where, would, where you would basically say the h function is exponential function uh, of a linear index, uh, index linear in uh, parameters in x. Um, now, this makes the whole procedure feasible uh, and therefore um, this is referred to as feasible generalized least squares estimation. So what you would do is um, you would first estimate um, these unknown uh, parameters delta using the squared or less residuals. And then you would run uh, weighted least squares using basically these estimated weights, hi hat, okay? Or the inverse of the hi hat. Um, this has very good um, asymptotic properties if the heteroskedasticity is correctly specified. Um, but even if not, uh, it might be better to do this um, than to do nothing. Um, because, um, you know, you might at least um, uh, become, uh, you know, like uh, more precise estimates. Um, and uh, what, you, what you should do, however, is um, you should be a bit um, cautious and at the same time uh, use robust standard errors. Okay, so um, then um, if you don't get it completely right, then your standard errors will still be correct. Okay, so you will make some progress in terms of efficiency, um, uh, but then, you know, in order to be sure that your inference is in order, is in good order, um, you should also use um, robust standard errors and that's fine. You can basically combine uh, these two approaches. Let me close with an example from the book. What we see here are estimates from uh, regressions of net financial wealth measured in terms of thousands of dollars on income, also measured in terms of thousands of dollars, age, gender, so that's a male dummy to be precise, 401k eligibility, 401k that's um, uh, a pension plan, and then of course an intercept. Um, yeah, that's the specification. Um, here we see that um, we have about 2,000 observations and here we see uh, the R squared measures for the four different specifications. So what do we have? We have OLS um, for uh, the simple case where we just uh, regress uh, net financial wealth on income. Then we have weighted least squares. What Wooldridge does is he uses a very simple weighting function. The weighting function here is uh, simply income. Uh, so sigma square i is specified as sigma square times income. Then we have, I'm sorry, then we have um, OLS um, for the model with age, um, gender, and um, pension plan eligibility as well. And then again, weighted least squares again uh, with the same weighting function. The standard errors for OLS are the robust standard errors. And here on this slide, the standard errors for weighted least squares are the standard, um, you know, OLS standard errors. What do we see? Well, um, the key uh, coefficient of interest here is arguably um, the one on income. Um, so we get a point estimate of 0.821 um, here in column one. That means increasing income um, by a thousand dollars is related to um, an increase in net financial wealth of $821. Okay, um, when I compare now um, the estimates across specifications, across columns, then I do see that they actually don't change a whole lot. They get a little bit smaller uh, than this, but um, you know, 
that's not substantially different. What I do see is that um, the weighted least squares estimates um, are more precise. Uh, so the standard error goes down from 0.104 to 0.063. Um, and you know, uh, putting uh, more controls uh, into the model, these three additional explanatory variables doesn't do much uh, to the point estimates and it also doesn't do much um, to the standard errors. The last thing um, Woodridge um, did, or the last thing I'm going to show you um, for uh, heteroskedasticity is uh, this table here. So what we see here is um, the estimates uh, from uh, column four of the previous table. So these are the weighted least squares estimates with the non-robust standard errors. And then what Wooldridge did was he also used robust standard errors um, in combination with weighted least squares. And obviously the point estimates will not change, but the standard errors will change, um, but not by much, right? Um, so um, I told you before that you can combine weighted least squares with uh, robust standard errors. Um, and what you see is that they increase here for this coefficient, they increase for that coefficient, they decrease for this coefficient, and they decrease for that coefficient. Okay, um, and that is actually something that can in principle happen. Um, so standard errors, robust standard errors can be bigger or smaller, but in general, in applied work, what you often find is uh, that standard errors uh, actually um, go up when you use uh, robust uh, standard errors. Uh, so if you want to be conservative, then normally what you would do is you would go for robust standard errors. Good. So that's what I had for heteroskedasticity. I hope it was clear and